Welcome to Hope Online. We are so glad that you're joining us today, wherever or whenever that may be. If you are new to Hope or we haven't had the chance to connect with you yet, we would love for the opportunity to. You can text NEW TO HOPE to 97000. That's NEW TO HOPE to 97000. Today we're going to be continuing to learn about Jesus, so grab your notebook, your Bible, and your pen, and let's learn together. Welcome to Worship at Hope Community Church online services in Midland, Texas. My name is Lindsay Slayton and uh, I'm happy to open the Word of God for you today. Um, uh, the, your pastor is John Slayton and I'm his father and I've been invited to come down to speak for his 10th anniversary. He and Christy will celebrate 10, 10 years at Hope Community Church this weekend and we're very happy for that. It's the reason I'm preaching to celebrate a 10th anniversary there and just to kind of let him take the day off as far as the pressure of preaching is concerned and I'm happy to be back in Midland, Texas. Thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> hey, take God's holy word and turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. I invite your attention to that particular passage and uh, while you're turning there, I want to uh, tell you that there was a college professor of mine that said the difference between you now and you in 10 years from now will be the people you meet and the books you read. Of course, the greatest person you could ever meet is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the greatest book you could ever read is the Word of God. And so as you look at those things, um, you, you understand uh, exactly what he's talking about, especially whenever it comes to, to life. Now, there's some things in life that we need to know. Uh, these are timeless truths and these are timeless principles I want to share with you this morning as you celebrate this 10th anniversary. So I want to celebrate with you. I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you uh, to keep on keeping on with these four timeless truths that are found in 1 John chapter 3. I think you'll recognize them because there are things that we need to know. You know, there are a lot of things in life we ought to know. Uh, there are some trivial things, how that you're belt should match your shoes, you know, things like that. Um, but these are principles that are timeless. I think you're going to see some powerful things in it. And so in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Whoso committeth sin transgresseth the law, for law is the, or sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, Whosoever sinneth not hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that is righteous is righteous. He that is rather, uh, he that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Man, the Son of God, was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, or revealed, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I want to share with you some timeless truths from this passage this morning that will help you, again, as I say, to keep on keeping on. God has blessed you in the last 10 years, and I'm um, looking forward to what the Lord's going to be going, doing in you and for you and through you as um, John and Christy lead, lead your church. Uh, but I want you to see four things. And the first thing that I see here is that God and his love are real. God and his love are real. Look what it says here. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Now, stop and think about that just for a moment. He says, behold. He says, stop, look. Look, behold how great something that cannot be understood. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed uh, upon us. Now, it's interesting that the word used in uh, manner here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, 
behold, what manner a love. The, the word manner is the same one found in, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 27, whenever the disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee and the, the storm hit and the seas were raging and they thought Jesus was, uh, Jesus was sleeping, they thought he didn't care and they woke him up and he went out and he said, peace be still and the storms stopped. Nature bowed to the power of the Son of God. Uh, and they looked and said, what manner of man is this? Who can do that? Well, that's what the word is. We don't understand it our language because it's, it's above us. It's outside of us. It's astonishing. It's not of this world. Now, let me illustrate it for you. Uh, when our two older sons were in elementary school and we were in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma on staff there, I would drive them maybe to school or, or maybe someplace else. And we'd pull up to a stoplight and I would be watching the stoplight and I would do this. And when that, the light would go from red to green. And my boys looked at me and said, what? And I said, hey, I've got powers. And they said, what? The next light pulled up and I went, and it went from red to green again. And they said, how, how can this be? How, how is this happening? Now, you and I know I was watching the cross traffic light. And when it went yellow, I knew in just a few seconds it's going to turn green. They didn't know that, but I did. But the look on their face was just amazing. They didn't know what to think. How could this happen? Well, multiply that a thousand times. And that's what the disciples did with Jesus when he said, peace be still. And he calmed that storm in that sea. And they said, what manner of man is this? Outstanding, otherworldly, out of this world, astonishing. That's what he says here is the kind of love that God bestows upon us. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Now that's so not so much a statement as it is as an expression of awe and wonder. And he talks about the incredible love of God that moved him not just to save us from our sin, but much more than that. Because Christian, listen, he could have stopped there, but he didn't. He didn't. He didn't have to do that, but he saved us from our sin and he didn't stop there. He said, all right, now you're forgiven, but more than that, I'm gonna make you part of my family, my forever family. You see, when someone is born again by receiving Christ as Lord and Savior, they become a part of the forever family of God. How cool is that? And that's what John is marveling about in this statement that he's making. And again, he's attributing it to the love of God. See what kind of love this is? See what kind of love the Father hath, hath, hath given to forgive us and to make us a child of God. And so the question comes up then, well, how does someone become a child of God? I wasn't raised in a distinctively Christian home, um, but my mom wanted to make sure that we knew what a church was and uh, what the church should be teaching. And growing up, I became aware of the thought that we're all God's children. And I understand why people say that. I understand what's behind that statement. It's the idea that we're all created by God in his image, and therefore people just assume that we're all God's children. But that's not true. We are not all God's children. We are God's children by a new birth. But there's a condition of being a child of God, and that condition is found in John chapter 1 and verse 12. It says, as many as received him gave him power to become the sons of God. And so when we receive him, when we believe on his name, when we, when we trust Christ as Lord and Savior, and, and we believe in what's called a first-hand faith, you have to do that. It's between you and God. And whenever you receive Christ, you are born into the family of God. You see, you're born, you're not born a child of God, you're reborn as a child of God. And, and he goes on to say in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 12, that you're born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh, but by the Spirit of God. So that means it's not a human thing. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the love of God for us, and we're born again into the family of God. Now, that's, that's the love of God, and that's fascinating. That's amazing. You know, when I think about uh, uh, the love of God, I think about how he transforms things. You know, technology over the past 10 years has been amazing. I wrote down a couple things that we have seen, everything from computers to cell phones to online uh, uh, shopping to self-driving cars 
technology transforms things, but nothing transforms things like the love of God can take someone who is a sinner and save them and put them on their road to heaven, saved from a place called hell for a place called heaven. Well, now, time out just for a second. Someone might ask the question, uh, God and his love is real. Uh, how, how do we know there's a God and how do we know his love is real? Well, that's what John is saying. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Well, how do you know that there's a God? Is it rational to believe in God? Is your faith a blind faith? Let's well, see, blind faith is incredulity. God tells us that our faith is based on reason. But there are millions of people around the world that do not believe in God. Many believe that science and religion cannot coexist. And so on one hand, uh, who, those who believe on, in God say you, you, uh, you should just have faith and try not to examine the evidence. But the Bible says, gee, the Lord says, test me, try me, prove me. He does not want us to have empty faith or incredulity, but faith based upon reason. Now, this blind faith uh, is not what God wants us to have. Um, and so you ask the question, well, can you prove God exists? Can you, can you do that? What evidence do you have for your belief that God exists? Those who believe in God have many different, often contradictory uh, ideas about God's nature. What does the Bible say about that? Well, the Bible reveals to us that we have a God that, that provides sufficient evidence for his evidence. Let me take a little time out and give you a couple of things to think about whenever you think about the the existence of God. Number one, number one proof, creation demands a creator. The Hubble telescope continues to reveal previously unknown galaxies. Our awesome universe simply astounds us. And under the night sky, King David said in Psalm chapter eight, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? David called the universe the work of, of God's fingers. That's a phrase for child's play. For the Lord, creation is just simply child's play. Well, he knew that God created the universe. Did the universe have a beginning? What do scientists say? Famous astrophysicist Stephen Hawking, in a lecture entitled The Beginning of Time, stated the view of, the most, of most astronomers today, the universe has not existed forever. Rather, the universe and time itself had a beginning in the Big Bang about 15 million, billion years ago. Now, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. I believe that God spoke and bang, it happened. But I don't believe it took 15 billion years. I think in the direct creation of God, that happened. Science agrees with the Bible that the universe has not always existed, but that it had a beginning. Sir John Maddox, author of What Remains to Be Discovered, wrote a Time Magazine article and said, over 70 years ago, the universe was found to be expanding, but now there's a model of how it began. He calls it the Big Bang. At the beginning, there was literally nothing, a void, not even space. Then there came into being a tiny speck of superheated space that contained enough energy to create all the stars and galaxies that fill the sky with enough left over to, for the expansion of the universe. That's what he said in that, in that particular a lecture and math, uh, Matt, Matt it continues. There are also serious philosophical problems created with the Big Bang, problems that cannot be explained. Worse, he says, nobody has been able to reconcile quantum physics with another great triumph of the 20th century physics, Einstein's theory of gravitation. Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm a preacher. I know what the Bible says, and I believe that 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 creation demands a creator. Number two, life demands a life giver. And that's what the, the, the Bible teaches. And science has also said the law of biogenesis states that life can only come from life. And so we understand that even though science has never, ever, not once created life from non-life, sometimes scientists are determined to reject the idea of a creator God, that they put aside their own scientific objectivity and stake their belief on what science has shown to be impossible. Well, the Bible explains that life originally came from a life giver. The Bible teaches that the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril, nostrils the breath of life. 
uh, we believe that life demands a life giver. The, a quick proof, number three, law demands a lawgiver. Well, science has discovered that our physical universe appeared from nothing, but how did it happen? Science cannot explain the origin of the universe, but there must be an answer. Contrary to what some believe, the Bible's simple answer is consistent with true science. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when God created, he also created certain physical laws. That's what the Bible says in James chapter 4 and verse 12. There is one lawgiver. In Isaiah chapter 33, verse 2, 22, God is the lawgiver, both of natural law and spiritual law. See, those are those great laws of the universe God created. Let me give you a proof number four. Design demands a designer. Not only do we find, um, not only do we find predictable physical laws throughout the universe, we find tremendous evidence of intelligent design. Demand, de uh, design demands a designer. We find that God designed all this, the creation, the purpose. That's how one reason that you know that there's a God. Number five would be fulfilled prophecy when you look down through history. Number six, answered prayer when you see God moving and working. And uh, the Barnard Research Report says Americans believe in the power of prayer. Four out of five believe that prayer can change what happens in a person's life, and that's prayer. I think seven is a way of life that works. A history, the history of the world is generally the history of mankind living on its own, apart from the instruction of its creator. Human beings have experimented and continue to experiment with man-made institutions of education, science, government, business, and entertainment. But what progress have we made? The Bible challenges you to live the way of life, not the way of death, and that's God's life. John chapter 10, Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that more abundant. Those are just some quick little, a little time out to talk about the proof of God. And what's his proof of his love? Well, all you gotta do is look at Calvary. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the first timeless principle. You ought to thank God that your, your church, your pastor and your church stand on that truth. But the second one is this. Look what it says here. Beloved, we are not, the, we are, uh, beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we'll know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Well, the scripture's pretty clear that Jesus Christ is coming again. That's the second great truth, the great timeless truth that we need to hang on to. Christ is coming back again. Now, I'm a baby boomer, so I know who Paul McCartney is of the Beatles. You may, you probably do, know who the Beatles were and who Paul McCartney was and is, and. Um, the Guinness Book of World Records says that Paul McCartney is the most successful musician and composer in popular music history. Well, when Paul McCartney's group, the Beatles, broke up, he uh, tumbled into a dark place. He locked himself in his Scottish home smoking weed and getting drunk. And after uh, several months, his turnaround began when the chords of a song came to his mind. He didn't record it until later, but the music made him feel optimistic. And he crafted it into a song for his children. He called the song, Great Day. The lyrics talked about a future day that was coming. And this is what he says. I like the idea of a song saying that help is coming and that there's a bright light on the horizon. I've got absolutely no evidence for this, but I like to believe it. It helps to lift my spirits. Well, Paul McCartney didn't realize how close he was to the truth, right? There is a great day coming, and it won't be too long. There's a bright light on the horizon, and we have plenty of evidence for it. There's biblical evidence for the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's found in the scripture. You see, see prophecy coming to pass. And let me tell you, when that happens, it's a great day of hope. Hope is not a maybe. Bible hope is not a maybe so it's a confident expectation of what God says is going to happen. It's an eager expectation of what God promises. It's the reality of something that, uh, uh, that, that God promises and the energy surges through us. It's going to be a great day of homecoming when all family members are gathered together. And that great day 
whenever Christ comes back again and he calls us out and it's going to be a great day of healing. The greatest healing uh, event in human history. Jesus healed when he was here on earth, but when he calls us out, there's going to be no more cancer or ailments or old age or physical discomfort. It's going to be a great day of happiness. Um, this thing called the rapture, we use it as a statement for, a, for an event, but it really means unbridled happiness. If you're going to use it in a sentence, think of the rapture of the rapture. A day of unbridled happiness. Jesus Christ is coming back again. That's what the Bible says when he comes back. That's the second great truth. The third great truth is that, as he mentions here, the devil is real. You see, we have an enemy, and he goes on to talk about this enemy that causes sin, uh, that caused uh, ad, that led Adam and Eve to sin. Uh, it, whenever he rebelled against God in heaven, he sinned. Um, and the Bible says that he that committeth sin is of the devil. And the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. We're talking about a real devil. Uh, some people believe the devil is just simply some evil force, or there is no such thing as a, as a devil, but there's, a, there's an evil force. But the Bible teaches that, that the devil is real. He's the ruler of this world, a spirit creature who became wicked and rebelled against God. And the Bible reveals the devil's personality through the names and descriptions of Satan, which means resistor or adversary, a slanderer, deceiver, tempter, not just a, a principle or a quality of evil. Some view Satan, the devil, as just a principle or a quality of evil that exists inside us. However, the the Bible records a conversation between God and, and Satan, and God is perfect. He, he, he could not have been talking to an evil part of himself. Satan tempted Jesus, who is free of sin. He's a very real personality, is the greatest created being in heaven, and rebelled against God. And thus, the Bible shows that the, that the devil is real and not merely a personification, not merely a personification of evil. Um, should we be surprised that many people don't believe the devil is real? Not at all. Um, for the Bible says that Satan uses deception to accomplish his aims, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. One of his greatest tricks has been to blind many people to his, his existence. I, uh, I read a book called Killing the Witches by Bill O'Reilly over vacation um, this, this past summer, and I came across... Uh, toward the end of the book, and that particular book uh, tr tracks the Salem witch trials and, and the accusation culture that was there and he sees here today, and then he tracks it through uh, this evil through uh, the Revolutionary War and then in, into uh, this experience uh, that the movie was written by the exorcist and, and all those things. Now, he's not a theological writer. He's a, he's a historical writer, but this is what he says. There is active evil in our country. It is present for all to witness. There are thousands of cases of shattered lives with more emerging every day. Something is generating all this. Something, Bill O'Reilly says. Well, he's right. Something is. The devil is our enemy. He's our adversary. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your life. Your, uh, uh, your church. He wants to destroy everything that's good and beautiful. Um, and really, if I were the devil, I, I wouldn't want a church preaching the gospel, this life-saving, soul-saving gospel of Jesus. I, I wouldn't want anybody praying. I wouldn't want anybody giving. I wouldn't want anybody serving. I wouldn't want anybody caring for lives and helping and being a blessing. Um, but greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so there is a real devil. That's one of those timeless principles. He's there. The Bible says you resist the devil, he he'll flee from you. Um, but know that he's there. And then the last one here is in verses 9 and 10. This is pretty powerful. Salvation is available. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. And this the children of God were manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, 
neither he that loveth not his brother. Salvation is what he's talking about, being born again. You see, the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, the word sin is an archer's term. And it means when that archer pulled that arrow back and he, he shot that arrow, he didn't just miss the bullseye, he missed the whole target. Well, that's the way we are outside of Christ. We're born sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death and the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So all we have earned is separation from God forever. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and he offers salvation. See, the Bible teaches if you're going to go to God's heaven, you've got to go God's way. And that's through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. As many as received him, gave he them power to become the sons of God. And you know what? When we look at these four great timeless truths, God and his love is real. It's, they're real. Uh, Christ is coming back again. And this hope as the child of God purifies us. We, we live a right kind of life, so we're not ashamed it is coming. But the devil's always there to try to knock us down and to cause us to sin and to hurt the work of God. Satan or, uh, Salvation is available. That's the fourth one. And you may need to trust Christ today. Maybe you were like me. You weren't raised in a Christian home and you needed to make sure. That's what I did. I made sure. Um, I bowed my head one time and I said, God, if I've never done it right before, I'm going to do it right now. Please forgive me. Come into my heart and my life and be my Lord and Savior. Maybe you need to do that. Maybe you do. If you are in that situation, why don't you take a moment? See, salvation is not in a prayer. It's in a relationship with the person. Again, if you're going to go to God's heaven, you got to go God's way. And that's through a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he offers that with you. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. God and his love are real. Christ is coming back again. That's a fact. Satan is real. He's fighting us. And salvation is available. You see, these are great truths. It's a great battle. But we can do it. And I'm praying that your church will do it together. Stay faithful. Stay strong. Lean on each other. Love each other. Serve. Give. Grow. And reach people in Midland and across the street and around the world so that when we all get to heaven, we'll see that great day at that time. Now, God bless you. If you have questions, call the church office. There'll be uh, numbers on this, uh, on this video. Call them if they can help you to pray with you or pray over you, whatever your need is, friend, that, uh, uh, that you'll walk with God and you'll enjoy a great life with him. And pray with you. Father, thank you again for life and eternal life through our Lord Jesus. Bless this message as it goes out. And I pray folks would receive Christ because of it, be encouraged because of it, learn some things because of it, and would glorify you in their lives because of it. Please bless as we serve you today and this week, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I look to see you in the future. Hey, everybody. Pastor John here. I just wanted to take a quick moment and connect with you as we do with every time we get together uh, online or in person and just have a moment where we designate a time just to be reminded of the importance uh, and impact of your generosity. And so we just want to say thank you for uh, faithfully and consistently giving here to hope. A uh, reminder that you don't just give to a church, you give to God through a church. And uh, one of the ways that your generosity is making a huge difference is we get to stand in a room just like this. This is our connection center. Our old one is right here. We, we're expanding out that way because we want to make more uh, space for people. And uh, we need it. Uh, for our church to keep growing and reaching people, we need to constantly look for creative ways to expand and make best use of our facilities. And I just wanted you to know, when you give the projects like this, it happens. And so I uh, want to keep you up to date, make you aware of the amazing things that are happening because of your faithfulness to give. Thank you very much for giving today. Thanks for being here today. We have several different events happening for you and your family over the next few weeks. You can find signups for these events in the back of the auditorium. Remember to mark them on your calendar. Our Grief Share ministry has begun meeting on Wednesday nights. Grief Share is designed to create a caring group to help walk alongside you through one of life's most difficult experiences. If you or someone you know has lost a loved one, this ministry is for them. On August 20th at 6.30 p.m., our young adults will have a movie night in the auditorium. This is the perfect opportunity to connect with other young adults in our church. Sign up today. 
Is baptism your next step? On Sunday, September 8th, we will have baptism. If you would like to take this step or learn more about baptism, you can sign up today. We will have child dedication on Sunday, September 29th during our 9.30 and 11 a.m. service. If you would like to dedicate your child, you can register today at hcmidland.com slash child dedication. Mark your calendar for Sunday, October 6th for our Friend Day during both our 9.30 and 11 a.m. services. Friend Day is the perfect opportunity to invite your one more to join us. Once again, thank you for joining us here today. We are praying you have a great week and can't wait to see you again next Sunday.